There's a trick in the game industry I only learned recently, which is using an RGBA texture to filter out colors or materials or entire shaders if you want, allowing you to blend these materials together with pixelless resolution. Obviously this has a trade-off of memory versus GPU performance, but if you're looking to optimize on your file size, then this is a great way to do it. Additionally, if you're not doing anything too complex with the shader, it really shouldn't be a big hit on the GPU. After this tutorial, I used my own game as a guinea pig, and this probably would have been a 2 megabyte 2K texture, but instead it's a 12 kilobyte RGBA mask. So hopefully you can see the benefits of this. If you're using Blender, it's limitless on its potential, and if you're using Unity, it's limited on the noise texture you import in. Or if you want to generate the noise yourself, you can do that too. I'm going to go into an overview explaining how to accomplish this in Blender and in Unity. You don't need to use Blender to do the Unity version. You don't need Unity to do the Blender version. So if you're here for one of them and not the other, it's okay. I'll put timestamps below if you want to skip one of them. Keep in mind though that I won't be going in depth in the Unity tutorial as I'll be referencing stuff I taught in the Blender section. So if you're lost at any point in the Unity, you can turn back to the Blender for some tips on it. After I explain it briefly, I'm going to go into a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it all. This method starts with using an RGBA texture and then painting it onto the mesh. I'm doing this on a plane just for demonstration purposes, but it can work on any sort of mesh that you want as long as you have it unwrapped. From there, we separate these channels, the RGBA, which is red, green, blue, alpha. We separate those out and then use a brush stroke to change the gradient fall off. The normal fall off for a brush isn't that appealing, so we do a shader to change it. This is pretty simple actually, we just use noise and then have a color burn to change the fall off area only. It will be a bit different in Unity, but not too much. Once we have these separated and have the brush stroke we want, we can combine them back together by using the inverse of the brush strokes as a mask. All of these combine together and they layer on top of each other. You could do it in the way they mix with each other, but for me I wanted it to be layered on top so that way materials don't blend. Now when you look here you won't see the same result I had in the very beginning, and that's because after doing this tutorial I actually tweaked it around a bit more. And I encourage you to do the same, mess around, try to get something that you like. Keep in mind the noise texture can be literally anything. I have a noise here, but you can have it be a Voronoi, Musgrave, any combination of noise that you want. And a way to keep that in line with the fall off, because you might notice it's messing with the white or the black of the image, is to have a clamp so that you clamp the values between a certain gray range of that fall off. As far as getting it into Unity, what you want to do is export the four materials you want to use, or if you have colors, it's even simpler than that. But in my case, I use materials, so you export those as 1K images. Then once you export those, you'll obviously need to export your RGBA texture and your noise texture. You export those and then we'll combine them into Unity and we'll have to rebuild the shader there. If you're just here for Blender, hopefully some of this can help with performance as far as rendering time goes. As far as Unity goes, I think that's where this will be the most helpful. You don't need to use Blender to get to the Unity part. You could totally just make these images in Photoshop, like you could paint the RGBA in Photoshop or any sort of image editing software. I think that pretty much covers everything for the overview. Now I'm going to go into a step-by-step. Before starting, I just want to go over the layout I have. Essentially, I have the UV editor on the left there, then the 3D viewport on the right, and then the shader graph editor below. The first thing we're going to need is a mesh. You can use any sort of mesh you want, but I'd recommend just using a simple plane for this tutorial. But we're going to unwrap it. I just do simple unwrap, but you could use Smart Project if you're using a different object. After that, we're going to do a new material. You should have an option in the shader graph just to click new. If not, exit out of whatever material you had before and then click new again. Once we have this, we're going to delete all the attributes except for the out. Then we're going to do Shift A to add an image texture. As for naming this, you can do it whatever you like. I'm simply naming it Texture Mask. And for the image size, I'd recommend anything less than 1K. For testing, I pushed it as far as 120 by 128 and that still worked for me but keep in mind this only matters for the accuracy of your brush stroke it doesn't matter for the fidelity of your brush stroke because with the shader we're going to be changing the fall off so it only matters where the brush is not how the brush looks once you've created that image i'd recommend clicking the safeguard icon which looks like a shield that way it won't get deleted and then that window in the top left the uv image editor we're going to set it there as well and i'd also recommend doing image save as that way we keep this image saved to our actual computer blender can be a bit finicky with image files so it's important to save it first keep in mind that when you save your project it's not saving this image, you have to save it specifically. Although Blender will warn you if you try to leave without saving it. Now that we have all this set up, go back to the 3D viewport and you can change it to texture mode. You can do this by holding Z and switching to texture paint. Or in the top left there where it says object mode, we can switch it to texture. Once we have this, we need to switch to red, green, or blue to paint onto it. And we need our function set up to add. Keep in mind that it needs to be exactly red, exactly green, or exactly blue. You could tweak the values to make sure you're always getting there, but I prefer to have that color picker on the right there. I just quickly made this in Photoshop, but I'm sure you can find it online if you search RGB color picker. As for the alpha, there's a specific setting for adding alpha or removing alpha, and the color doesn't matter for this. You can have it be set to any color, and it'll still erase or add the alpha. Then if you want to erase a specific color, I'd recommend going to subtract and then having it be that color. If you want to get rid of everything, you can do subtract with white, or just do mix and then choose black. 
pretty much covers everything for how to texture paint. Now we're going to get into how to use the shader. Although keep in mind while you're painting that we're going to have this layered on top of each other so that alpha sits on the top, then below that red, green, blue. So you can consider blue to be your base layer. Although I should probably point this out now instead of later on. After this tutorial, I realized that adding alpha to an image actually increases the size of it. So to get by that, I actually had the alpha be the base layer and put it below everything else. That way I could technically use an RGB image without the alpha, but still get the benefits of having that base layer. So keep that in mind. I don't do it here, but it is something you can do if you want to. We're going to go on to actually separating the RGB. This will be done with a simple separate node. So you can do shift A to add a node and then type in separate just to get that node. Once we have this, you can already see how it's filtering out. It turns the color white because we're just taking the value there. And then you can do control shift click on it to cycle through red, green, and blue. As for the alpha, if you're not using it as a base, you're going to need to invert it. So we can do that by getting an invert node and then applying it to the alpha. We can go ahead and send this out and you can see that one as well. Now that we've separated all the values, we're going to get a mix RGB node and we're going to put a color into that. This is about the simplest you can get with it. We have the color separated and then we can mix them all together. But what you can also do is plug a subgraph or another texture into there. So for example, if you had an image you wanted to put in there, you could do that too. I'm going to be doing a watercolor subgraph I have and plug that in, but I just wanted to show that it's very versatile in what you can do. If you're doing this for your first try, you can simply do color and you'll see the results work just the same. We're going to repeat this process for the green and blue values, and then we're going to move on to making the brush stroke. The first thing we'll need is a noise texture. I'm trying to keep the detail kind of low because detail will affect performance, but as for everything else, I'm just kind of going with what feels right. The scale should be something pretty high, but other than that, you can do however you want for the roughness and the distortion. Then I'm going to add a Veronoi texture and plug the noise from that into the smooth by changing it from F1 to smooth F1. Something with the noise is that you can really do anything you want here. I'm choosing to do this method, but you could certainly find any other method to create this noise. Whatever you choose is going to end up being the brush stroke, so do something that feels like it would fit with the type of stroke you want. Something I did was I referenced online images of calligraphy for the final result that I have in the beginning of the tutorial and used that to influence what I would do for the noise. By going in here, the way we're going to combine these is by doing a color burn. You can see here if we do the noise color burned with the red factor, you can already see it's working to mess up that fall off. Something cool about this is that it doesn't affect the white or the black area, it just affects the fall off. The reason it does this is because the noise is fluctuating between 0 and 1, 0 being black and 1 being white. The factor is just a number, so if we put an add node here and add to that value, you can see it's starting to overtake that white area. If we were to subtract it, it would do the opposite, it would start going over the black area. But now here, if we add a clamp node, you'll see that it clamps that value so that it doesn't go over. Part of this goes to your own interpretation of what you think is too much or too little, so adjust the clamp values for what feels right for you. But a good rule of thumb would be 0.1 and 0.9. Now that we've gone over getting our values into the range we want, we're going to take the color from that Veronoi texture and separate by RGB. You might be thinking, why not just use distance? And that's because the color has a different look than the distance on the Veronoi texture. It's not as simple as just going black and white. But we don't want to use color here, we just want to use black and white, which is why we're taking the R out. You could alternatively just turn it into a mix RGB and then do black and white, and that would work too. I'm just separating for this. Now that we've got that clamped, you can see the output and it's starting to look like a stylized brush. You could tweak it around more, experiment more, but this is what we're going to go with for now. There's only one last step we're going to do and that's to put it into a color ramp. I do this to get more of a tune effect going on, so keep in mind that all of this is based on the effect I'm trying to get. You might be trying to get something more realistic or more gradual, and so you'd want to change these values depending on that. I encourage you to experiment. I only came back to this several days later to come up with the design I did at the beginning of this, and I'm sure in a few days I'll come up with something different too. But once we're done with this color ramp, we're good to go and we're going to move on to putting this all into a subgraph. The first thing I'm going to do to get this in a subgraph is minimize all of these. Since we're not going to be looking at them anymore, we might as well clean it up a little bit. Then to get a quick look, we're going to plug it into the mix there and put a frame, doing shift A and then look for frame. And then you can do F2 to rename it and we're going to rename it to brush stroke. Then select every node that you want in there. And then you can bring those all together by doing control P. If you want to separate any of these nodes, you can do alt P and that'll separate any nodes you have selected. Once we have that, there's one more thing we need, and that's the brush mask. Personally, I want the mask to be the entire outline of the entire effect, by which I mean not including the color ramp area, the fall off. I'm going to do this in a bit of a crude way by getting a multiply value and then just going high enough until I can no longer see that fall off. It may not be the best way to do it, but it gets the effect I want, so I'm not too caught up on it. After this, we obviously want our mask to be the outside area of our stroke, so we're going to invert this. Now that's our mask done, so we're going to put a frame around this as well, and then we're going to put it all into a subgraph. We do this by selecting all the nodes and then pressing Ctrl-G. I actually messed up here and didn't grab the frames, so make sure you do that so you get the frames in there as well. 
We're not going to be doing too much inside the node group. I'd recommend renaming it. And to make sure you have two outputs, our outputs are going to be the color ramp and the invert. That's going to be our brush stroke and mask. There's really nothing else to do besides that, so we can press tab and go back to our main graph. Now that we have the brush stroke into its own subgraph, we can take the RGB and alpha component and plug it into the brush strokes, and then plug that into the mixes for the factor. If you've been using the alpha as another stroke rather than a base layer, you're going to want to invert that data before you put it into the brush stroke. If you are using it as a base layer, you're going to want to keep it normal and then make sure it's at the bottom of this order rather than being at the top of it like I have here. I'm going to be plugging the watercolor into all of the color values for these, but again, you can keep it simple and just do regular colors. We're almost done here. The next step is going to be mixing these together, and we're going to do that by getting a mix RGB node. We're going to plug our red color into the first color, and then the green color into the second one. For our factor, we're going to take the mask of the brush stroke of the red, and then plug that there. By having the mask in the factor, we're effectively making it so that they only mix on the red's mask. This allows the red to overlay the green, and then when we're going further, what we're going to do is combine the red and green, and I'll show that here. You can see that we're combining the red and green masks, and this will allow us to mix both the red, the green, with the blue. Because with these masks combined, we can effectively layer the green and the red on top of the blue. The same idea applies to the alpha. Just make sure that if you're doing the base layer, you have it at the bottom. And if you're doing it as a stroke, you have it at the top. The last thing to do is to combine all of these with your last mask, whichever one you're using, whether it ends up blue or alpha. And then you can take that output and either put it into another shader if you want it to be part of something else. Or you can just output it into the surface as its own shader. So that's it. If you want this shader for Blender, this is pretty much it. If you wanted to do mixing shaders instead of just textures, it's a bit easier and easy where you can just treat a shader as a texture, but in Cycles it's going to be a bit more complex if you want to get that effect. If you want to use this in a game engine, I'm going to be showing how you can export all this stuff for use, though even if you're not using Unity, a little bit more of this might be useful, but then after that it's just going to be Unity stuff. The first thing we need to do for transferring this from Blender into Unity is that we need to bake all the textures. If you're just using colors, you can skip the texture baking, but you'll still need to bake the noise. In total, we're going to have four to five textures. If you're using an alpha as a stroke, you're going to have a fifth one. And essentially, we're going to have our baked red, green, blue, and alpha. The final one is going to be our noise. Our noise texture we're going to bake as well so that we're not generating it on the fly in Unity. For all of your bakes, keep in mind that these are going to be the actual textures in game, so you want these to be high resolution. Where this can become really useful is if you're using seamless textures. I'm going to be baking seamless textures here and you can find more resources online on how to do something like this. If we use seamless textures, we can essentially make different types of objects using RGBA textures but keeping these same base textures. The noise can be used across all of these, which means we only want one noise texture, which can be used across every object. Because of this, we can have higher resolution in our noise, and so you can get something like 4K or even 8K. And if you want to get more resources without having a high resolution image, what you can do is map your noise inside of Unity. That way you can have a 1K noise texture and just map it out, and it won't really be noticeable because the noise is so small on the detail side, and so players aren't going to notice that you have it mapping. But as for actually saving these, we're just going to go into the top left there and do image save as, and then save it as whatever you want to name it. I'd suggest having them all in the same folder and have it be R, G, B, A, and then the noise value. Once we have all of those exported, we can hop into Unity. And if you weren't watching the Blender tutorial, you can do all of this stuff in any sort of image editing software you want, just make sure you export them as images. For example, you could paint all of this in Photoshop and it would work just the same. One thing to make note of for Blender is that if you're baking, it will only work inside of Cycles. You can't bake inside of Eevee, or at least I don't know any way to bake inside of Eevee, so you'll have to switch to Cycles. If you've been doing this the same way I am, you shouldn't have any problem switching over, and I'd recommend disabling all the lighting settings since we don't really need that for the bake. For baking the noise, what you're going to want to do is take the output from the subgraph we have for the brush stroke and then put that into the output. Then we can just simply bake that as its own texture. For the Unity portion, what I have here is just a blank scene, and we're going to be making a simple shader graph. And the idea here is just to replicate the one from Blender inside of Unity. Since they're going to be mostly the same, I won't be explaining it again. If you need explanations for it, you can look back at earlier in this video. But there will be a few things that are different because they don't carry over from Blender to Unity. If you want to use this shader as a subgraph, you can easily convert it into one and then use it in a different shader as well for adding more complexities to it. But the very first thing we're going to do is drag in all these image textures into a folder. And then we're going to make a subgraph. A small note here is that I'm using the universal render pipeline. If you're not able to make a shader graph, it's likely that you don't have the correct packages for it. So make sure you have the package for the lightweight render pipeline. The first thing we're going to do here is drag in our texture mask, and then we're going to expose it as a public variable that can be manipulated on a material. We're going to do this as well for all of the other materials we have, so you can see me creating those in the inspector on the left there. We're then going to make a new material in this folder, and we're going to switch to our shader. Make sure you save the shader, and then we're going to plug in all these textures into our exposed variables that we just made. 
you can see we're not using the noise in this and that's because the noise is going to be a global variable that's used by all instances of this shader. Now moving into the actual shader itself, make sure you have the RGBA texture plugged into that sample texture 2D and you can see Unity already has a way to split out that red, green, blue, and alpha channel. So this makes our job a little bit easier when we go right into making the brush mask. Going in here to create the mask, you can see it's the same with the multiply, but what is different is going to be the blending mode. So Unity doesn't have a color burn, so instead we're going to be using a dodge. You can experiment with other modes as well, but I found dodge works as well as the color burn. Luckily Unity has a clamp, so we can use that as well to trim the noise so that it only affects the falloff area. Next we're going to use a sample gradient, and this will act as our color ramp. You can customize the gradient however you like, and then save it as a prefab so you can use it later. I also really like how Unity has that preview in every single window, which is really nice for kind of experimenting with what you want to do. For instance here, while I was doing this tutorial, I changed it from dodge to soft light, and I kind of like that effect too, so feel free to experiment while you're doing this. From there, we're pretty much finished with the brush strokes, so we're going to condense all of these, minimize them as much as we can, and then we're going to plug them into a subgraph. To do this, we're going to select everything, including the input and output lines, and then we're going to right-click and convert to subgraphs. Save it as whatever you'd like. I recommend having it the same name as your current graph, but then a underscore and then whatever the subgraph is for this instance brush stroke. Then we're going to need to hop in to put one more output, which is going to be a vector 4, and this will be our mask. You can take it from the sample gradient and put it into the output there. For this, I'm not doing the multiply, but you could also do the multiply to change the mask as well. Again, there's a lot of experimentation in the brush, so don't take what I'm doing as what you should do. Once we have these renamed, we're going to hop back out of here and go into our regular graph, and we're going to duplicate these four times and plug in the corresponding textures, so the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Make sure you change the RGBA channel so those correspond as well. Now unfortunately Unity doesn't have a mix RGB like Blender, but it does have a lerp. The way lerp works is that it takes one value and then goes to the second value over time. So for instance, at zero seconds it would be at the first value. At one second it's at the second value. You can see how we could use this in the same way factors used in Blender. By treating this lerp in the same way we can do the same mask method using mask as the value of time. Don't think too hard on why a vector 4 can get plugged into time, but it still works in the same way is mixing them together with that mask. We'll follow the same principle all the way down until we get all of them blended together. Now here I am going to be using alpha as a base layer so you'll see me doing it in that setup. We can take the red and green masks and add them together just like we did before and plug that into the time for our next lerp and then for our final lerp we can take the time of the mask of the alpha. We'll plug our alpha in there and then we have our finished shader. Just kidding, there's one more thing we need to do, which is use a replace color node for our alpha mask. We're going to plug this in so that we replace all of the black of the mask from the previous layers so that the alpha can sit as the base. Then we're finally done. So that's everything for this tutorial. I hope it's been helpful. This is a technique I didn't know about, and I've been working in games for quite a while. I don't know if that makes the technique very secret or me very stupid, but either way, I hope it's been enlightening for you. I hope I got across that you can really do a lot with this. It's just the concepts that I want to get across. You can change the brush strokes, do different things, mess around with different materials, shaders, um, change it from layering to overlayering. There's still a lot of ways you can improve upon this. I'm going to show some examples of my current work that I've done for my game using this technique. The shaders aren't exactly what they are in this tutorial, so it's just an example of how you can evolve this. I will also linger on some screenshots of the shaders in their entirety just in case you need to see them for a little bit more and I'll give timestamps to those. That's pretty much everything I have to say. I'm going to show the screenshots now and then give a brief outro that doesn't have anything to do with this tutorial. Just for a quick outro, I wanted to give an update on when I'll be posting stuff. For tutorials, I don't have any set schedule of making the videos. I just try to wait until I have something to offer. I never want to make a tutorial that I feel is redundant. I'll also never have sponsors or ads or anything on these videos. I mean, I can't control YouTube putting ads on it, but I'll never have my own ads. And I'll never have any paywall. It'll always be free information. As for game development, I'm going to keep developing my game. I am going to be working on it for quite a while, but if you ever want to see those updates, it'll usually be a monthly basis. Unless I don't feel like I have anything interesting to say. Anyways, that's all I wanted to add, so I won't drag out the outro too long. Thanks for watching.